Welcome everybody to the LSE Old Theatre for this year's Wollstonecraft Society Lecture. Um, my name is Alpa Shah and I'm a professor in the Department of Social Anthropology and a faculty associate of the International Inequalities Institute here at the LSE. So we at the International Inequalities Institute have been delighted to host this annual lecture with the Wollstonecraft Society for the last four years. Our speakers have been Angela Saini, Helena Kennedy, and Amartya Sen. And this year we are really thrilled to welcome Baroness Shami Chakrabarti to talk about her just published Human Rights, a case, the case for the defense. This brilliant book which is outside um, for you to all, all to purchase and, uh, and, and browse through. Um, in the true spirit of Mary Wollstonecraft's vindication of human rights, Shami Chakrabarti's timely defense shows how the idea and the spirit of human rights is crucial to how we think about and act on all kinds of issues today, problems of today, climate change, Poverty, war, artificial intelligence, it's all there. Shabi Chakrabarti is a leading British human rights lawyer and a campaigner who has written and broadcast widely and held several public roles. A legislator in the House of Lords, she's the author of On Liberty and Off Women, director of Liberty, the National Council for Civil Liberties from 20, 2003 to 2016, she was Shadow Attorney General for England and Wales from 2016 to 2020. Baroness Chakrabarti's lecture will be discussed by Connor Geerty, a professor of human rights law at the LSC and a barrister in practice at the Matrix Chambers. Professor Geerty has published widely on terrorism, civil liberties and human rights and has a new book about to come out on homeland insecurity, the rise and rise, and rise of global anti-terrorism law. So it's a real honor to host you, Baroness Chakrabarti, and I, I gather that this is actually the first major event of this book, so it's a real honor for us to be hosting that here at the, uh, at the LSC. Um, I, I can't wait for you to talk about it and for Professor Geerty to discuss it, but before that, let me also introduce to you B. Rowlett, B. Rowlett is a writer and public speaker and a programmer of events at the British Library. She wrote In Search of Mary on the life of Mary Wollstonecraft and has just published One Woman Crime Wave. Congrats, B. B. Rowlett led the campaign for the Wollstonecraft Memorial Sculpture at Newington Green and is chair of the Wollstonecraft Society. I'm going to hand over to B to say a few words about the Wollstonecraft Society. But before I do that, let me just quickly mention that for Twitter users, the hashtag for today is hashtag LSEIII. This event is being recorded, and we have a large number of people joining us online, and hopefully we'll be making this available as a podcast subject to technical difficulties. And as usual, there's going to be a chance for all of you to ask your questions, put questions to our speakers both online and offline, and um, online and in person uh, um, after the panel has spoken. So over to you, B. Thank, Thank you. It seems incredible that the idea of human rights can have enemies. There's a timeless quote by Maya Angelou on feminism. It goes like this. I am a feminist. I'd be stupid not to be on my own side. I feel the same way about human rights. If you're a human, why would you not? And yet, some humans not only don't trust human rights, they actively want to fold it into some suspicious idea of trickery, uh, dress it up as something other, something foreign. Um, I used to get upset when people thought they didn't need human rights. If you think you don't, then lucky you. But this is a step change, and Shami explores this and many other perplexing developments in her excellent and useful book, which is on sale after this <laughs> event. <laughs> get your hands on a copy. Um, and I'm delighted, Shami, that you're this year's Wollstonecraft Society speaker. Thank you. 
So my name's Bea Rolat, I'm chair of the Wollstonecraft Society, and I want to take you back in time so that you can meet the namesake of this lecture series. Mary Wollstonecraft was born in Spitalfields in 1759 into a handkerchief-weaving family, a family that was sliding rapidly down the social scale, a family that did not believe in educating girls, a family dominated by a violent, abusive father. Wollstonecraft had exactly the same access to legal rights as a saucepan or a chair, but that did not impede her instinct for justice. If anything, it strengthened it. This Wollstonecraft channeled her, her early rage into action, alongside desperately trying to acquire an education by hanging around families with books. Um, she also tried to achieve financial independence via some fairly crappy jobs. Um, and this rage flourished throughout this period of her life into the writing of not one but two foundational human rights treaties. A vindication of the rights of men laid the groundwork for the, the idea of rights as it was emerging, this new language. And as the, as the language evolved, she asked who actually qualifies for these rights. And this line of questioning then leads, in 1792, to her vindication of the rights of woman, which opens with the words, I demand justice for one half of the human race, and argues that one, women are humans, breaking news, and that by virtue, they're human by virtue of their capacity for reason, and therefore, two, they must be educated. And it's significant that all of Wollstonecraft's life's work was dedicated to the cause of education. So her first published work was called Thoughts on the Education of Daughters. Bit of a clue there. Sadly, we don't have time right now for the blockbuster roller coaster of Wollstonecraft's life, how she became Frankenstein's grandmother, she was an abolitionist, the world's first and only treasure hunting single mum philosopher on the high seas, her many what Virginia Woolf calls experiments in living, and um, the fact that she died not one but two deaths. All of this, for another time, suffice to say she was a fierce, tireless advocate, indeed an early architect, of what we now call human rights. She was, in the words of Amartya Sen, Nobel laureate professor Amartya Sen, who is a patron of the Wollstonecraft Society, who gave our first lecture, he called her perhaps the most underestimated thinker of the 18th century. Well, not if we've got anything to do with it, it's time she was estimated the Wollstonecraft Society exists now to introduce free, accessible, and very chirpy human rights materials into primary schools up and down the country. And the idea is to introduce Wollstonecraft and her ideas to young girls and boys, ideally, before they get the chance to meet people like Andrew Tate, Andrew Flake, whatever his name is. <laughs> So please take a leaflet, there's leaflets dotted all around you, take a little photo, access our website and support us however you can. In the meanwhile, it's my huge delight now to hand over to our main speaker, Shami Chakrabarty. <laughs> Shall I just stand, stand here by this? No. Perhaps I'll... Yeah. Is, is that better? Yeah. Pull it down. Otherwise it's like radio. I might... <laughs> Do that. Um, does that. Is that better? So, um, thank you, B. Thank you, Alpa, for that lovely introduction. Uh, and of course, it's a huge honour to be to be giving a talk in in Mary Wollstonecraft's name. Uh, she appears in my book, in chapters one and five. I'll say no more than that. But she she is a very important person in the history of human rights. Um, I'll say no more than that. Chapters one and five, for those of you who <laughs> are interested in picking up a copy afterwards. It is also a huge honour to be back in the old theatre at the, at the LSE, which has been a very important place in my life. Um, I was an undergraduate here at the, um, at the turn of the, eight, 19, the 1980s and the 1990s. I nearly said 1880s there. Um, and it was right at, the end, right at the end of the Cold War, Literally, the Berlin Wall came down, I think, in my first or second, maybe my second year as an undergraduate. And um, over 10 years later, this was also a very important place to me when I was a young, a young director of Liberty, when Connor Geerty, Professor Geerty, who you'll hear from in a bit, 
and Professor Nikki Lacey made this space an intellectual space for activism and dissent at the beginning of the war on terror. I say at the beginning of the war on terror because many a human rights activist would tell you that that war has yet to end. Um, and of course, it's an enormous privilege to, to be here in these very difficult times for human rights. Human rights, as we've heard from B, are being prosecuted against every day, sometimes by Mr. Sunak and sometimes by Ms. Braverman and by others. Um, but today I get the opportunity to open the case for the defense. To believe in human rights is to believe in human beings. It is to strive for everything we need to live with the possibility of flourishing in the world. It requires thoughtful empathy, an appreciation of our species as creatures of body and mind, of instinct, emotion, faith, logic, and reason. Individuals, but also social beings. <clears throat> Humans yearn for autonomy, but also belonging and respect. These twin aspirations combine in the concept of dignity. This recognizes that every human life matters and that as far as possible, each of us should have agency in the way we live. Human rights provide the poetry of both cries for freedom and pleas for protection. When the sacred and secular collide, each seeks this special higher ground, as do all competing interests in battles for liberty, equality, recognition, resources at home and abroad. The world is in turmoil, ravaged by wars, real and imagined, proxy and phony. It is riven by oppression, inequality and impending climate catastrophe. What many had come to rely on as the post-1945 settlement for securing greater justice, equality and peace is now once more in flux. This is especially, if not uniquely so, in the Middle East and in Europe, where two world wars and then the Cold War once began. However, despite all sorts of progressive advancement, global population growth and technology and weapons proliferation bring an ever greater interconnection that makes conflict anywhere perilous for people everywhere. As a currency of values, human rights are constantly called upon and yet still reviled. Invocation and attack may come from the same voices at different times. And there are skeptics across the political spectrum. They question whether we need any higher laws, let alone fundamental rights that the powerful, whether via might, privilege, or numbers, may neither bestow nor withdraw. They contest the basis of these principles, their content, limits, application, and enforcement. So is it possible to agree or at least establish the ground rules of reasonable disagreement so that human rights might survive and offer comfort and a compass for the future? I believe so. And this book is my contribution to that endeavor. There are competing theories about where human rights come from and why. Crucially, their development is completely intertwined with every complex episode in the history of human society. Attempts at uncoupling them are always a mistake. I write as a practical lawyer and com campaigner of 30 years, not as a philosopher or historian. As a legislator, I make distinctions between laws and policies with which I disagree and those which seem clearly to violate dignity and human rights. So denying the vote or adult minimum wage to 17-year-olds sits in the first category. 
I disagree with it. But not to allow these guarantees to some of them on the basis of their sex or race would fall squarely into the second. There must be clarity, as without it, rights defenders are vulnerable to accusations of anti-democratic tendencies or worse still, to charges of cherry-picking, even of modifying rights for our own political convenience. Human rights must be defended against complaints that they are individualistic and selfish rather than uniting, that they are ethnocentric and Western rather than universal. In a healthy political community, comfortable in its skin, and which debates the application of human rights in policy and lawmaking, judges need not be overly politicised. Nor need human rights invade, rather than inform, the business of elected governments that respect the rule of law. I consider various baskets of human rights and the positive and negative obligations on the state to actively deliver or not interfere. Civil and political liberties are essential to democratic life, as are social, economic and cultural rights to any quality of existence. Very few rights are described as absolute, but many are qualified or limited by protections for other people. What can they help us dis decide? What are their necessary limits? These questions are essential if rights aren't to be distorted and devalued beyond recognition. How much can we proportionately interfere with qualified rights, say to privacy, speech, protest and property? What are the potential clashes between them? Equal treatment is essential to understanding and delivering human rights. As wars and pandemics, which bring death and hardship to some, and eye-watering windfalls to others so graphically demonstrate, human rights must, to some extent, address the asymmetry of both power and protection that lies at the heart of every major injustice. However, they can't by themselves resolve them. Human rights evolved from the ethical, moral and political frameworks of individuals and communities through struggle. They now inform those frameworks in return. Their sparse but often lyrical drafting conceals tales of courtroom drama, political imprisonment, persecution, death, torture, and fighting the evil fiction of racial supremacy in the air, on land, and on the high seas. If you read the texts quietly, you can almost hear distant drums and liberation songs. Still, they also provide some binding obligations that must be enforceable in law against states and perhaps even supranational public and private bodies in the near future. Ethics, morals, politics and law often overlap, but not so much as to undermine the importance of their distinctions. The late great legal philosopher Ronald Walkin describes these clearly and compellingly. Ethics inform my personal choices Morals, how I relate to others. Politics is the way that communities and societies make decisions and laws one important way of declaring and enforcing those choices. As in Eleanor Roosevelt's famous adage that human rights begin in small places close to home, it's in the personal sphere that we first apply our values and experience our rights and freedoms. A parent attempts to raise their child with age-appropriate levels of agency and protection. They seek to monitor, vet, 
and limit the child's access to outside influences in both the real and virtual worlds. Whether consciously or not, these decisions involve ethical and moral questions of the young person's right to privacy, expression and association, and appropriate limits on these things. The political community, as ultimately represented by its lawmakers, grapples with similar questions, but on behalf of all children. While most modern democracies will grant a considerable latitude to individual parents to make informed decisions in the interests of their children, they'll also set some enforceable legal parameters. Indeed, not to do so would be a violation of the rights of the child. When these rules are breached, there'll be a range of both civil and criminal legal consequences for those responsible, whether drug dealers, pornographers, social media platforms, educators, or the parents themselves. However, the ultimate legal, as opposed to ethical or moral human rights obligation, to provide both respect and protection of the child will rest with the state. A parent may be cruel or neglectful and legally accountable for this under the ordinary laws of the land, namely criminal and child protection law. Still, what is commonly understood to be the human rights violation is when the state doesn't adequately protect its children. Human rights don't replace ethical and moral choices, nor public, political and policy decisions with legal ones. Instead, they should inform all of these. When a child protection regime is challenged, perhaps for setting a minimum age of um, alcohol consumption or social media access that's deemed either too low or too high, the courts can be expected to give considerable respect so that's deference in domestic courts and a margin of appreciation in international ones to the democratic authority and deliberations of those who designed the scheme. However, courts are nonetheless essential referees. This may be little more than a modern evolution of the rule of law that has long bound governments and the governed. While democracy and human rights are distinct creatures, they must walk hand in hand. As human progress has required larger and more complex public and private institutions, so it correspondingly requires that these be held to account by both the popular vote and the law. Outside the home, a self-styled whistleblower or a freedom fighter considers how to respond to the abusive behavior of a corporation or a government. In extreme circumstances, they may decide to breach civil or criminal law, perhaps by revealing trade or state secrets or by taking even more dramatic direct action. Now, even if you share my view that such conduct might be justified in the face of tyranny, the decision to break the law is just the beginning of this person's ethical maze. I say human rights provide a significant guide even to what kind of illegal conduct may be conscionable. I'm talking here about human rights values and principles rather than laws for two reasons. Firstly, human rights and other constitutional laws, like broad duties to respect privacy, rarely apply directly to individuals, but instead to state agencies. Secondly, the subject, subject of our hypothetical dilemma has already decided to break the law. They may have broken duties of confidence to their employer, official secrets legislation, or laws against breaking and entering in pursuit of their view of the greater public interest in exposing grave abuses of power. Yet, human rights principles, like the duty to demonstrate proportionality and be no more intrusive than necessary, which usually serve to limit police power 
must now act as moral constraint on our self-appointed ethical hero. So the whistleblowing journalist should redact the names of innocents who might otherwise be put in harm's way. And the freedom fighter who attacks the dictator's arsenal should avoid harming people as opposed to property in general and civilians in particular. By taking the law into their own hands, the outlaw, however well-intentioned, has taken on a far greater moral obligation to consider the human rights consequences of their actions. They have perhaps acquired even a level of obligation normally reserved for those who act on behalf of the state. In a further twist, this may in turn become a solid legal consideration for any court subsequently deciding how to deal with this law-breaking in the public interest. In the face of present global challenges, health and wealth inequality, technological revolution, violent conflict, and climate emergency, our human rights will be tested. Rights thinking doesn't provide perfect solutions to these acute problems, but it can be of assistance and enduring value in addressing them. Critics deploy a number of familiar, if contradictory, straw men. They complain that elite lawyers and judges use human rights law to trump politics and democracy. Yet these rights critics often fail to consider that ground rules and referees are essential for democracy itself. They lament the many violations that aren't prevented as opposed to being challenged under rights laws after the fact, and the latitude that judges grant to governments, the opposite of the trumping democracy criticism. They paint human rights as the enemy of either liberty or security, and deliberately ignore the presence of both of these values within its carefully calibrated scheme of protection. Some point to noisy human rights pushback in the face of political authoritarianism, as if the former were somehow responsible for the latter rather than the other way around. Some of these arguments are like suggesting that the, the legal prohibition of murder fails to prevent it being committed in the first place and even leads to significant numbers of unresolved crimes. Disturbingly, they attack both the foundational and universalist claims of human rights as greater threats to citizenship and the nation state than international crime, pandemics, global corporations, or climate change. These arguments and the ideologies behind them are far from new. A certain kind of nationalism and its close cousin imperialism have always preferred that rights be restricted to citizens, free men, or some other necessarily exclusionary category of humanity. It goes without saying that when the barons extracted Magna Carta from King John at Runnymede in 1215, they very clearly did not have the rights of serfs, women, or foreigners in mind. Despite or perhaps because of these imperfections of the past, there are English sentimentalists who will claim the Great Charter as their own while berating international human rights. Their US and French counterparts do the same around the Declaration of Independence in 1776 and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and of the Citizen in 1789, respectively. If these rights nationalists are skeptical or even hostile to the development of international human rights, they argue that there was a historical break before the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 or even before the rights revolutions of the, of the late 1960s. This alleged fracture is supposedly so clean and dramatic that other accounts, Lynn Hunt's being an excellent example, 
of universal rights being rooted in, or at least inspired by, much earlier stories and struggles must be pure fiction. I disagree. Magna Carta is, of course, a primitive instrument which discriminates against those who were excluded from full personhood in its time. Clause 54, the Wilson Cross Society will love this one, provides that no one shall be arrested or imprisoned on the appeal of a woman for the death of any person except her husband, thereby allowing her to give lawful witness to her husband's murder, but no one else's, not even her child's. The clause highlights gross legal and institutional inequality. Nonetheless, the more famous and inspirational Clause 39, no free man shall be seized or imprisoned except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land, began the human rights journey to the fair trial or due process that continues to this day. Enlightenment isn't a single age, but a continuous process. The evolution of human imagination and empathy, greatly enhanced by literacy, culture, travel, and other forms of communication, as well as by knowledge and understanding of our darker histories of tyranny, inevitably broadened our notions of personhood, citizenship, and rights. So to recognize the rights of foreign nationals and children today is no more or less alien than it once seemed to respect those of women, people of other races, or in bondage. Post-war liberation movements were infused with human rights yearnings as well as with Republican nationalism. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, the European Convention on Human Rights in 1950, and the Refugee Convention in 1951 are no less rooted in earlier struggles against punishment without trial and slavery for being international. Of course, those documents had to cross borders in an age of aeroplanes, atomic weapons, and aspirations for a modicum of global governance. It should be even more obvious now, in the 21st century, with its billionaire-owned global corporations, that neither history nor oppression ends with nation states. There can be no self-determination of the people without some self-determination of the person. When power is so concentrated and supranational, so must be at least some of the means of holding power to account. Yet, while nationalists happily champion the more exclusionary rights of citizenship afforded by and for a political community on the basis of its various chosen thresholds, nationality, age, sex, residence, language, or property, Human rights at home and abroad are an obvious threat to a worldview that stops at the checkpoint. The chauvinist who rails against the influence of international ideas, including jurisprudence, is not so unlike the one who detests foreign food or the one who resents the reach of the law into his home to protect his wife or his child, especially from him. This exclusionary thinking is simply insufficient in our modern world. If internationalism offers global travel, trade, and terrorism, it must also stand for the recognition and protection of all people and their basic rights. How can we hope to take on the contemporary challenges of global inequality, conflict, climate catastrophe, and the new and undergoverned continent of the internet without shared values, higher laws, and some reasonably credible way of enforcing them. Now that the dominant faction within the British Conservative Party has taken back control and got Brexit done, 
it can no longer blame the European Union for every social and economic problem that it has failed to address during 14 years in government. So it turns its rhetoric towards environmental campaigners, human rights lawyers, and desperate refugees in small boats instead. Mr Sunak's flag flagship slogan for the imminent general election is stop the boats. But with the cruel stunt of attempted forced transportation of asylum seekers to Rwanda now on the statute book, his real target is courts, not boats. Whole rafts of both the Refugee Convention and the Human Rights Act are now disapplied by the Safety of Rwanda Act. This overturned a finding of fact by our Supreme Court last autumn, that the Republic's asylum protections were inadequate and unsafe. UK courts have their usual jurisdiction drastically stripped back by this post-truth legislation. This makes litigation in the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg almost inevitable. And the moment, the moment such a claim is threatened or launched by refugee lawyers in the UK, the Prime Minister, our Prime Minister, will blame what he has already branded a foreign rather than an international court for his failed policy. And then, as distraction from unconscionable inequality and failing public services, he will try and turn the general election into a referendum on pulling out of the Council of Europe, of which the Strasbourg Court is part, and which was founded, which was founded by the Treaty of London 75 years ago last Sunday. Success for him would mean stripping rights against degrading treatment and unlawful detention for fair trials, personal privacy and freedom of expression, not just from the boat people, but from every man, woman and child in the United Kingdom. By contrast, in the latter part of my book, I um, discuss what the practical realisation of protection might look like in the second half of this century. We must make our most agreed upon fundamental freedoms accessible, both in the popular understanding and in actual redress, rather than being idealised and illusory in every part of human society. For too many people, human rights reside in the sanctity of the courtroom with lawyers and judges as the priesthood. For a great many others, the ultimate court is that of public opinion with politicians and commentators as oracles. For my part, I believe that human rights values must animate living rooms, classrooms and courtrooms, cabinets, interrogation, and even war rooms. While everyone is welcome, my book isn't principally for lawyers. It's a reflection on human rights for people across the democratic spectrum, whether instinctive supporters or skeptics. All human disputes are ultimately resolved by violence, negotiation, politics, adjudication, or some combination of these. Rights and freedoms, whilst they are a celebration of the individual, are supposed to help communities navigate conflict without constant or regular recourse to war. It's easy to look at our world and see that human rights aren't winning in this important respect. But we should all feel ownership of our hard-won rights and freedoms. How else can we grow in confidence in all the arguments about how they should be applied? 
to lack a general memory or understanding of what our most basic rights are is to walk even more vulnerably in the world. It is to be robbed of a human heritage as important as numeracy, literacy, art, science, sport, and music. The nurse, the coder, and the actor should, I think, be able to argue about whether the judge or the politician got a particular decision just about right or completely wrong. That is what a truly free society looks like. When we all feel more empowered, this framework of precious protections will be less open to attack by vested interests in populist clothing. It will be ever more potent in protecting people and planet for generations to come. Thanks for listening. Professor Getty, over to you. Thank you so much, Baroness Chakrabarti. So powerful and important. Yeah. Uh, I've got uh, 10 minutes, which doesn't count the period spent trying to open this bottle. <laughs> So I, I think this, I think this is a very good book. Actually, I, I reviewed it for the Irish Times uh, on Saturday, and when I was reading it, I heard writing the review. I heard Shami. I'm not going to call her Baroness Chakrabarti. This new vogue. <laughs> You'd never know from this book, by the way, that she is. People who don't know about our antiquated system would think this was a different person, Baroness Chakrabarti. She plays down. <laughs> She plays down that. Her first name in this book is Shami, not Baroness. So I'm going I'm to follow that. But she was on talking with one of these multiple Tories. They're always the same. White guy in power for a long time, complacent. And you manipulated him into a corner so embarrassing, so contradictory, that I think for a brief moment he even noticed it himself. <laughs> that was very enjoyable. When it dawns upon one of these people, that they have maneuvered themselves into a corner. It doesn't dawn on them rarely, or often, but when it does, it's amusing. And I was reminded of uh, Shami during the 19, the noughties, with the whole terrorism thing. And uh, what a powerful, what a powerful person she was in this culture, and is. Because this book, I think one of the things she said, it's for lawyers, but it's not only for lawyers. And what lawyers do, I, I, am, I, am, I am one of them, is they damn with the demand for research pedantic accuracy. This book is accurate, but it's not jumping through the hoops of the exposition of this section and that section. You can do that. She did that for ages. You don't have to do that. You try and engage the community. And what has been damaging to human rights has been the way in which it has been, it has been parked as a kind of legal thing. Very early on, there was a fellow called Jack Straw. I have no doubt he's one of your big mates in this House of Lords thing. They're all there now. I went to the House of Lords once. I was waiting to get in. I, I met, saw so many people I thought were dead. It was extraordinary. I asked the porters or whatever they're called. They're not really porters. They were dressed as though they were members of the royal family, but their job was porters. A man was helped out with about four sticks. I said, who is he? I thought maybe it was Disraeli. And they said, sir, they said, we have no idea. <laughs> anyway, enough on the House of Lords. Uh, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> Can we strike that from my attempt? That was ridiculous. Better out than in. It's sorry. better... <laughs> uh, better not taped than taped. Teams of people now crowd over my 
my word on the video, trying to find things. Well, there will be something on Gaza coming. This is definitely, Shami said, a, a very difficult time for human rights. I, I think we've always been saying that. You know, we're always saying Britain is becoming a police state. We never say Britain is a police state. These are difficult times for human rights. I'm going to suggest to you that they might be, as my friend Stephen Hopgood said in a, in a, in a, in a very hostile book, uh, there might be end times for human rights. Uh, I think that's not implausible. I think certainly we're at a moment in our culture where we have to work out whether this term is for the future or whether it's a quaint reminder of a past series of transient successes. Uh, I agree with uh, Shami's capturing the essence of human rights, uh, equal treatment, dignity, belonging, respect. I called it once years ago a visibility project, and I stick by it. Human rights is about getting seen. Human rights is therefore dynamic, and I've never had any time for those lawyers who think that it's a finite number of rights that are available to the people who have them already. It's dynamic. It's always saying, here we are, over here. And it's because I believe it's that, that I have no difficulty whatsoever in classing the Magna Carta, for example, as you said, as uh, of kind of carrying a human rights instinct. Uh, because these are wins for people. Now, in retrospect, they look already very visible, but they're shouting, look at us. And in the Bill of Rights thing in 16, whatever it was, the same, look at us. And then something very important happens. What happens is that having been looked at, it's difficult to resist the calls of others to be looked at too. So I think the driving force of human rights has not been law, though law is a primary protector. The driving force of human rights is shame. The driving force of human rights is some understanding of the wrongness of hypocrisy, of the unacceptability of double standards. That's an amazingly important thing to have people feel, because they then see that what they've got, they cannot plausibly explain why others should not have it. And so I applaud double standards. Because double standards indicate in those who are embarrassed by them an understanding of the impossibility of their position. That's relevant to today, which is why I'm wondering about the end times of human rights. So I want to keep that notion of shame. And I want to talk about these two aspects of human rights. And Shami's right, you know, that Human rights provide a vehicle for the addressing of many of the problems of today. In Shami's book, it's, it's, there's a bit about the Provincial English British Human Rights Act, uh, but there's quite a lot about how you can deploy the language of human rights to deal with complicated, pressing problems of today. It's not a bad template. Uh, there's a chap who's been in this room many times who's just been re-elected as mayor of London, Sadiq Khan. And Sadiq Khan has, in my opinion, brilliantly shown us the potentiality of a political debate conducted in the language of human rights, because he has explained why he regards the fact that many, many Londoners are alive today and not poisoned by pollution as a win. Many of his political opponents seem to regard it as the most appalling thing that they're alive. They don't say that. They talk about their absurd liberty, rooted in their wealth, their laziness, and their malicious conduct towards those less able. You'd never know it, reading the various propaganda broadsheets of the opponents of Sadiq Khan, that the majority of Londoners, I gather, don't even drive cars. And yet they're alive because of what Sadiq has called at his lowest point when they were developing their vigilante campaigns against the extension of Ulysses a human rights issue. 
If political leaders have the moral courage to take the stage and explain things in human rights terms, you'd be surprised how far it will get. You'd be surprised. And so all the manipulations by the opponents to try and destroy the possibility of his re-election, the fiddling with the campaign methods, with the insistence on, 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 on visual identification and with the transformation of the voting system, failed. That's a human rights example to us all. The human rights thing has got positive and negative aspects, both dependent, but primarily the positive side on shame. I'll talk about both and then I'll stop. First of all, what do I mean by the positive side of human rights? I mean that the idea of human rights is to make people visible in order to give them better lives. There was an old distinction between civil and political rights and social and economic rights, which feels rather out of date today. Take one example. What about the unborn children, the generations yet to be born, whose lives will be destroyed by the effect of climate change? Are they not entitled to a quality of esteem, or at least some esteem? So we see human rights as able to reach into future generations as well as present generations. We see human rights to be able to be about people living decent lives, unpolluted lives, as Sadiq Khan would say. We see human rights as being about the alleviation of extreme poverty. There are these ways in which the language of human rights engages politically to improve our life chances. That is dependent on it being something about which our culture cares. We've had tremendous <coughs> representatives in the United Nations come and tell us that we have extreme levels of poverty in this country. And we need to care that we have extreme levels of poverty because that, those representatives cannot force us. They cannot require court orders from some notional international court to end poverty. So back to double standards. Shame. We need to be shamed by the arrival of a person whose expertise in housing tells us that we have the most disgraceful housing position in the Western world. We need that in order to make the positivity matter, because we're not yet ready, and I think we shouldn't be ready, to allow some world court to let us out of our position. We need to do it ourselves. Shame is essential as a driver of moral action. Now, what about negative human rights? Negative human rights are a bit different. It's not saying we'll give you a better life. It's saying we'll keep you alive. We'll stop people killing you. And in particular, we'll stop the state killing you. So we have got a really important fa f aspect of human rights, which is now called international criminal law. And what we've worked out, building on international humanitarian law and growing out of tribunals directly after the Second World War and then with regard to Rwanda and with regard also to uh, the former Yugoslavia, we've got an idea, which is both that we will prohibit things like genocide and we will cause war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide to be punished before an international tri tribunal. Human rights as prohibitory, human rights as negative, human rights as do not do rather than do. And there, we rely both on shame and we rely also on law. And we have reached an extraordinary point in our human rights world, which is this, that if we take no action in a situation where there is mass slaughter of men, but hugely women and children, in utterly defenseless positions, with weapons used by the human rights abiding global north, if we continue to take no action in the face of that, if we see the destruction of the culture before our very eyes. We have a debate next week in LSE on the destruction of the university sector in Gaza, and we have speakers from uh, the West Bank and from Gaza coming to talk to us. If we are prepared to continue to allow that, what does that say about human rights? We've had some senators uh, advise the International Criminal Court that they better not issue warrants or there'll be punishment. We've had the Americans volunteer that there is no jurisdiction to issue warrants, warrants arising out of the Israeli destruction of Gaza. It's a very big point for us, and I make no apologies for reverting to it at the end of my talk. It's a test 
of whether human rights matter, whether we are prepared to be energized by mass killing of civilians. It's extraordinary. And if we're not prepared to act about that, really, what, what does human rights mean today? Well, I'll tell you what it might be, and this is the final point. It might be the beginnings of the end of shame. And if we lose shame, we lose human rights. There was an interview, a very, very good interview, by some ludicrous, extremely right-wing woman. I can't now remember her name. She's got a double-barreled name. She appears on one of those television programs funded by those rich hedge persons. Uh, with Ben Habib. And she did the thing that I think should be done more. She said, so what will you do about the people in the boats? And he hemmed and hawed for a bit, but she pursued it past the normal minute. And he admitted he would let them drown. He admitted he would let them drown. So that's the future if you lose shame. And if we allow the killings of tens of thousands of people on our watch, what's a few boat people? Thank you very much. Shame, we lose human rights. Shami Chakrabarti, would you like to respond? And then I will open up the floor to questions. Um, I, agree to, I, I agree with the professor, of course. Because his first name is, you know, my first name is Shami, his first name is Professor. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, 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 but I think, um, and that's a very, very powerful, as always with Connor, it's a very powerful way to, 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 to put it. The, the key to the kingdom is equal treatment. I mean, in my, in my career as a human rights campaigner, particularly when I was Director of Liberty, I had the privilege of speaking to many, many different audiences up and down the country about human rights, like non-legal audiences as well as legal audiences. And sometimes it's the, the primary school kids who are the real joy because there's no, you know, because it's not been edited and, and curated yet. And I used to play this game where I would say to audiences, but it, it worked particularly well with children, and the, and the younger, the better. What's your favorite human right? I mean, you know, do you know, and they, free speech, that's a good one. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. Fair trials, privacy, you know, and you'd get these different, and I'm like, yeah, but what, what do you think's the most important one? What's your favorite one? And then, you know, we'd do this for a few minutes, and then I would say, my favorite human right, the most important one is equal treatment treating others as you would like to be treated. It's these phrases that you find in all the great world religions and outside religion too. Walk in someone else's shoes, etc., etc. And And then I'd say to the audience, why do you think I say that? Why do you think this equal treatment, treating others as you'd like to be treated, it calls it shame? What, why is that the most important? Why is that more important than no slavery and no torture and free speech? And one day I was speaking to a primary school audience and a little boy said, because if we treated other people that way, there would be no torture and there would be no slavery. Hmm. He puts it more powerfully, perhaps, as shame. But it's, that is the key to the kingdom. And that is the difference between a human rights person and, say, a libertarian. You know, sometimes you make common cause with libertarians. They don't want, you know, too many cameras or too many, they want ID cards and whatever, and that's fine. You make common cause with anybody in, in, in a democracy, but the, but, the, but the dividing line is equal treatment. Because some of those people will, you know, they don't like identity cards, great, and they don't want too many cameras, great. But the, the test is when there has to be some kind of restriction, will they apply it to everybody? Will they take it for themselves? We saw it in the pandemic. Mm. Let the elderly shield themselves, said really quite an elderly senior jurist without a hint of irony. And let the, let the virus race through the population and Boris Johnson, some of our elders will die before their time. That's not the human rights approach. We, we don't leave people behind. Mm. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
I'll take questions from the floor and also we have online questions gathering too. Maybe that lady over there. Would you mind introducing yourself and uh, keeping your question brief, please? Thank you. Yeah, thank you uh, for taking my question, the first one. Um, from SOAS uh, Development Studies. Uh, I have a, a practical brief question. Is Do you think it's fairer for um, residents in the UK to have the right to vote as well? Because not everyone can um, become a nationality for all sorts of reasons. They ca cannot or they can't afford. So, thank you. Maybe we'll take one more and then, yeah, this gentleman over here. Thank you, in the pink shirt, or red shirt, pink shirt. Hi, I'm James, I'm a master's student here at LSE. Um, so you talked a lot about, in both of your talks, about sort of the theory of human rights. Um, and the, the ideals of autonomy and liberty and equality and so forth. Um, but how do those actually apply to um, various minority groups within the UK society and within the broader global society at large, like religious groups or people with disabilities or um, people from ethnic minorities? Um, do these same ideals apply to them and how do they apply to them uh, in the context of these, these very lofty theories of human rights that you've spoken about? Take those two together, because then. Um, um, sure. So, so on the suffrage, extending the vote to, um, it's generally a progressive thing, in my view, to extend suffrage to more and more people um, over time who have a stake it, in a, in a political community. And as I say, once it was revolutionary, the idea that that women should have the vote, and um, and now some people would be totally horrified by your question. You know, some of the rights nationalists that I, that I refer to, perhaps rudely, but I, I don't mean to be rude, I just mean to, to have the debate. I think some of the rights nationalists would be horrified at residents voting, and some of those people were very horrified when, um, when European, um, when, when EU nationals were able to, were able to vote in, 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 in UK elections. But, you know, at the same time, they would say no taxation without representation. You know, there are, all, there are lots of ways to say that somebody who has a stake in a political community... I mean, we're now, we are now talking about the political community rather than fundamental universal human rights because, of course, human rights have to always be extended to people who don't vote because they have to be extended to small children and so on who are not... You know, I, I personally think 16 would be quite a good age to begin voting, but I'm not going to say four or three or five, but they, but those little people have human rights. So we're now talking about something that isn't, um, you know, voting isn't, um, voting is a very, very important um, civil right, but it's not completely universal, but I think it should be progressively extended. Um, and I don't see why people who are residents, who are paying taxes and and our adult people who are subject to the normal laws of the land shouldn't with a sufficient with a sufficient um, um, residence or whatever the test would be um, have suffrage it, it, it extended to them it, it seems perfectly logical to, to, to me on the um, the second question was oh, oh lofty ideals as opposed to to, to to making rights real for I suppose we could say vulnerable minorities. Um, partly, we make them real by something that, again, some of the anti-human rights folk hate, which is the living instrument doctrine of human rights. That we um, that we develop it over time. That we, you know, as as Connor suggested, we we develop the rights narrative over time. It's not set in stone. It evolves with the ages. So there are positive obligations on the state. We talk about equal treatment as the key to the kingdom. No, I, I, I do anyway. Um, equal treatment isn't just about not actively discriminating, right? So if, for example, we say the only people allowed into this lecture tonight are going to be, are going to be men and not women, that's an obvious discrimination. If we say, if you're in a wheelchair, we will not allow you into the lecture, that's obvious discrimination. But what if... There is no lift and there is no ramp and there's only a set of stairs. That is discrimination. 
And but it's the kind of discrimination that requires, ironically, not just that you don't actively discriminate, but that you positively uh, deal with the, uh, you, you positively deal with people's differential needs. So you have to have maternity leave and you have to have childcare, and you have to have a ramp or a lift. You can't just always treat everybody the same because that will discriminate against people with, with different needs. So that's one aspect of it. You know, the living instrument, the, the positive obligations to, to bring people up so that they can have access to this most basic right not to be discriminated against. Um, and, you know, and we have in the post-war area era and subsequently done a lot of that in, in treaties and domestic laws that, that are about bringing people up, giving them, giving them practical access. Now, they're not all treaties. Some of them are tr treaties. We now have treaties for the rights of the child and the rights of people with disabilities that some of the right skeptics just rail against because they say this is all modern nonsense and it isn't Magna Carta. But this is what Connor referred to when he said, we're on this journey, and he's prepared to be on this journey because we want, to, we want this to be a progressive narrative where we, you know, the, as I say, enlightenment is a continuous process, and we're trying to make these rights real and not illusory and not lofty, as you, as you put it, for, for, for more and more people, whether they're children, whether they're pe desperate people, in boats, and by the way, the boats are going to keep coming with climate change. People can look the other way and say, "Let them drown." But this, you know, this is the problem that is not going away. And ironically, the people who don't, who want to let people drown in the English Channel now, are also the people who rail against the Strasbourg Court for saying human rights have something to say about positive obligations to do something about climate emergency. So they are, you know, pulling up. I think they're pulling up the drawbridge, but this is not going to, it's not going to work. Um, and as I say, in the end, if you don't make it work as a framework for deal, a framework for attempting to solve some of these problems, you're going to end up with violence and, and you know, some terrible, terrible circumstances for a lot of people, including some of the people who now complain about human rights. Mm, thanks. Other questions? A gentleman there, and then a gentleman there. So yeah, no, thanks. I'll just say something in between. And one of the things I loved about your book is um, both the the um, you know the need to protect what we have right now, the, the laws that we have right now, the human rights laws in this country, but also the futurism of the book and like how your you know it, it's you, you're bringing to account. You're bringing issues of not just climate justice, but also issues of AI and technology, and also um, corporations. You're extending the sphere of human rights, which you know is being talked about in relation to holding the state to account and how we treat each other. But what you're also doing in this book, which is amazing, is bringing corporations to account, which is something that doesn't get often talked about. Well, it's taken me a long time in my own life to get to that point because I was, you know. Ever since we had the Human Rights Act, which was passed in 1998, it was under attack, right? It's been under attack from the start. It was a sort of political child that was almost disowned by its own political parents and by others from, from the beginning. And it came into force in 2000, and then there was 9-11 in 2001. So this has had a, the Human Rights Act had a very, very difficult infancy in, in the UK. And it's, and, and it's continued, and now, you know, the Human Rights Act is... Is, is in young adulthood, and it's and now it's not just about scrapping the Human Rights Act, it's now about pulling out of the European Convention as well. And so for a long time, I was in what I call the stick, not twist approach. Don't call for any advancement, don't call for new treaties and, and new human rights because, because the, um, it, you know, the climate is so dangerous and fragile that you'll lose what you've got, but that just isn't, that's just not going to work anymore. Mm. If it is about protecting people and their dignity from abuses of power, you have to look at where power is. And, if, you know, and the new imperium is not the British Empire or the, or the Russian Empire. It's, it's, you know, it's the logos, not the flags. Mm -hmm. It's Bezosia and, yeah. and Muskland and, you know, and they've got 
you know, these great big corporate empires have got to be, I think, in the not too distant future, more directly mm. held mm. To, um, to human rights account. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Sorry. With the uh, hi, I'm, I'm Solomon. I'm a student here at the LSE. Uh, my question references uh, the UK stop the boats policy. Um, and it also references a very similar policy that uh, is already uh, in place and functioning in Australia. Their um, a policy where they uh, offshore process uh, asylum seekers on, on Nauru. Um, that is already, uh, at least in my reading, uh, a violation of the, the 51 Refugee Convention, and yet it doesn't seem like any of the existing uh, human rights uh, legislation and international courts have been able to action on that. Uh, do you believe that some change is possible, um, or is that kind of a, a demonstration of how our human rights um, foundations on the international scale uh, just aren't working and might not work for a very long time? Take one more question. Also with the oh yeah, sorry. Hi, thank you for that. Um, my name is Ram Houj, civil servant. Um, my question is that um, one of the things, like, like, despite the obvious importance of maintaining, implementing, and upholding human rights, one of the things that I personally struggled with as an atheist that I kind of don't think that there's like an objective moral or God-given set of human rights that we can kind of be informed by, rather it's kind of like a social construct. Um, and then that, but that kind of seems like a bit of a flimsy base for, you know, talking about and implementing human rights. So I guess my question is like, how do you navigate that and, and, and deal with it if, if, if like me, you don't believe that there is a God-given set of human rights that exist that we should try and uncover and, and look to kind of implement? And Thanks. Can we take one more? Yeah. Tell me, is that all right? Yeah. The, oh, just over there, the lady in the middle there. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Professor Gerti touched on the conflict in Gaza, and I was wondering, what role do you think human rights plays in navigating humanitarian, such a humanitarian crisis? So, um, I was wondering, what role do you think human rights as a language and a claim should play in the context of a political dispute that some might argue should be settled via diplomatic means through the UN? Um, so in other words, what role do you think human rights should play in the wider context of diplomacy and politics? Um, what is its role as part of the wider package of international politics? Thank you. Um, okay, so the, the philosophical, where do human rights come from? You're struggling because you're an atheist, so therefore, if they, you know, um, I, I, I do try and discuss this issue um, in, the, in the first chapter of the book. And um, in a nutshell, there, there, are peop there are people of faith who find it very easy to believe in human rights because they believe that a human is created in the image of God and therefore they... But, but there are many atheists um, who also believe in human rights, um, and that can be because they understand, because they're de it can be because they're Democrats, and they understand that no democracy can sustain without some fundamental rights and freedoms. And it can also be, and I remember Connor writing about this and speaking about this in the past, it can, you can believe in human dignity without believing in God. I remember you talking about a, a Darwinian approach mm. to, um, to believing that human rights are special just because of, of their ev evolution and because of the primacy that they have adopted over each other and, and that they've evolved to have over each other and the world. Um, so you don't have to believe in God to believe in human dignity. It might, and it might just be the equal treatment and the shame, you know. There are things that, you, that feel very important to you like being able to eat and to speak and not to be enslaved and to be tr treated with a modicum of respect. If it means that much to you and you can see that there is some, you can just look around you and see some, have some degree of empathy for other similar creatures, you might think that wh whether there's a God or not, there's some value 
in treating others as you'd like to be treated. But I think the, demo the, the democratic regulation um, approach is quite important too, because I don't see how a democracy can sustain for more than five minutes if you don't have a rule of law, but a rule of law that's also, um, in the Tom Bingham sense, informed by, by human rights. Um, Rwanda, yeah, I agree with you. I think these policies um, are in clear violation of the Refugee Convention and the UNHCR that has special responsibility, as you know, for supervising um, the Convention agrees, and yet this is happening. And I think that the short answer is that we have to push back, not just with courts and law, as Connor said earlier, but we have to do it with our, with our activism and our politics and, and every other aspect of, of, of human activity too. That's the, I think that's the truth. There aren't enough judges or policemen on earth to ensure a decent society or, or respect for human rights or even other laws, even criminal law. And so it has to be more than just about law enforcement. It has to be about animating these other spaces and activities too. And um, I think your question is about how human rights engage um, in things like um, diplomacy and war, and and again, I try to I try to um, touch on that in some of the later chapters in the book. Um, there's a, an American academic whose work I, I really enjoyed reading called Thomas Smith, I think at the University of Pennsylvania, who writes really beautifully about the relationship between human rights and international humanitarian law and how they cross fertilize. Um, and I think, uh, there isn't time now to go into too much detail, but I think that human rights are values as well as laws, right? So they were values before they were laws, and, you know, they were drafted on the basis of people sitting around and saying, you know, I'm a Confucianist and you're a Christian and, you know, we come from these different countries after World War II, but we think that these laws need to reflect um, various human values, and, and then when you apply the treaties, you, you're bringing your values to it as well. And that's probably the short answer to a much more complex question that I hope the later chapters of the book might, might help with. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Lois, we'll take a couple of questions from online, um, from our online audience, so, um, and, then, and then we'll come back. Yeah. Um, so the first question is from Poppy Sebag Montefiore. Um, who asks, um, how has the human rights community been impacted by um, critiques of human rights as being uh, Western in position and that they're not universal to um, everywhere? Uh, how do you respond to this? Um, and the um, second question is from Ruth Wills. Um, do you think that the 1951 convention needs reworking um, to ensure that refugees um, can be properly protected in the 21st century? <coughs> Shall we, is it okay if we take a couple more questions from the floor? Yeah. Santosh, please. Um, do you have that mic down here, please? It's because it's being recorded. Hello, I'm Santosh Das. I'm the chair of the Anti-Caste Discrimination Alliance. And thank you very much for, for your wonderful talk. Um, in the 1970s, a journalist described uh, people that you would now call Dalits within the caste system, formerly untouchables, as being subhuman. And since the 1970s, there's been a campaign to outlaw caste-based discrimination um, in this country. We have a law that is ready and waiting that this government has said that it wants to repeal that hasn't been implemented yet, I would say. So my question to you is the government not implementing the law or saying that it will repeal a yet to be implemented law, is that depriving this large community of people in this country uh, who've seen the uh, the bad impacts of caste discrimination being imported here, is that depriving them of their human rights? I think we've got capacity for one more. Yeah. I've got a pen, that's what I've got. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Hello, 
Uh, my name's Charles. Um, I'm a farmer and a litigator, and I was going to ask about the challenge. Um, I, I won't admit what else I am in case the professor takes exception to it. But um, <laughs> I, I, I was going to ask about the, the, the tension between um, human rights and the rights of nature, particularly with respect to uh, environmental issues these days. Um, but I, I'd also note this, this issue around shame that the professor raises and actually whether we have to give up on human rights um, if the United States votes um, for a shameless defendant uh, in a lower Manhattan courtroom um, in November, December, uh, because he is so shameless um, and the US will likely vote for him. Um, and I can't see how human rights can stand up to that democratic act. Could you comment? Oh, thanks. Well, over to you. I might need the professor's help with some of these. These are, <laughs> these are getting steadily, steadily more difficult. On it. Um, so, um, okay, the Western eth ethnocentric human rights are Western; they're not universal. I, I just, I've never believed that. As the daughter of migrants to this country, I have just never got that. And if you look at the places in the world where people stand up to tyranny and they want their expression, and they want their privacy, and they want a decent standard of living, um, and are prepared to, to die for it. I have never seen that as a particular Western phenomenon. So I just don't buy it. I just don't buy it. Now, I understand the argument. The argument often comes from, um, it often comes from the, le it comes from the left. It comes sometimes, and, and I try and deal with this at times of the book. You know, they're, they're, we've, we've been rude about, you know, Mr. Sunak's government, and, and as we should be. But there are, peop there are people on the left of politics who say this 1945 stuff was all just made up by the Americans to have a go at the Soviet Union, and it's just weaponized against the um, People's Republic of China or this, that, and the other. That's part of it. But that's a kind of political, ideological game. Of course, sometimes any law is going to be, if you like, weaponized, and we're all going to be hypocrites, and... And, and complain about other people's violations and, and not our own. But the weaponization of human rights abuses doesn't mean there aren't human rights abuses in the first place. Right? So if I point out that there are um, some human rights abuses in the People's Republic of China, that does not make me sinophobic. As long as I am doing my best every day to apply these principles with an even hand to the kind of governments that I might want to be associated with to the great old democracies like Britain and the United States. We just have to apply the principles with an even hand. But I believe that the principles and the values come for, from yearnings for dignity that are, seem to be shared by all people. Now, there might be, they are universal in their underpinning. Of course, there'll be some different cultural approaches. You know, some people um, are happy with more cameras and some people, you know, there will be, there, there, there is room for proportionate differences in different cultural contexts. There's no doubt about that. And we haven't had a chance to talk about cultural rights and, and the importance of not erasing people's cultures. But, but that, those rights are there for everybody in recognition of, of, of cultural difference. There's plenty of room for, for proportionate application and cultural difference. But the basic yearning to be heard, to be seen as connoisseurs, for dignity, as Ronald Dawkin so beautifully puts it. I, I see that as really universal. Um, and if I'm wrong about that, look at the shrinking interconnected planet that we live on, whether of the internet or whether of climate change. You know, don't tell me that, you know, that our differences are, are, are more important than, than that, that predicament of being a human right now. Um, the Refugee Convention to be updated. So I think that, again, stick, don't twist. Shami's nervous about this because they'll rip it all up. Um, the bottom line is that to cope with climate change, there will have to be, at some point, a further protocol or an additional treaty because a lot of people who are going to be in forced migration as a result of climate emergency would not very naturally fit within the 51 treaty as it's currently drafted. So there will have to be a debate at some point. So it'll either be you know, courts interpreting the convention um, in a more open textured way to deal with um, people fleeing climate emergency, but then that 
comes with political pushback that judges are being too creative and so on. I think probably there does need to be more treaty work, more statescraft of the kind that we saw post-1945. We need to see that again, not just in relation to... Um, so, so we use this phrase, climate refugees. We use it all the time, but it isn't really technically... Um, fitting with the 51 con convention because not everybody will be persecuted within the sense of the 51 convention without stretching without stretching the convention probably beyond um, good sense so I think we will have to do some more work it could be a separate convention it could be a protocol but something who does like that? that who does that work well it's not we're not seeing it from we're not seeing it from Mr Sunak and and, and mm -hmm. we're not seeing this is the point we will need a new generation of international states people who are prepared to have the imagination and the courage to do the kind of work that we saw after World War II. I had high hopes towards the end of the pandemic and I think maybe a moment was missed but a moment can come again and I just apologise on behalf of my generation. It may be you know, maybe it's not too late for us, or maybe it'll be the next generation, but that kind of imagination, courage, and statecraft is going to have to come again. There's no, there's no alternative, mm. in, in, in my view. And then, um, human, uh, oh, Cass, I totally agree with you, of course, about, um, a, a, about caste racism or caste discrimination and so on. And, and this is why the, you know, the, the people who are anti the living instrument are just are just talking such rubbish, you know, because people once thought that sex discrimination was fine. Because why? Because women were a little bit less than human. In a lovely patronizing sort of way, but they were just a little bit subhuman, right? And whenever you think that about a category of humanity, that is contrary to human dignity. And so when we get into the precise legislation that we should have in particular countries, then we must do what is required to, to achieve what needs to be achieved to deliver people's equality on, on the ground. And there are different ways of potentially doing it. I mean, if you, if you would, it, there is an argument that armed with Section 3 of the Human Rights Act, you could arguably even read in to the Equality Act a view of race discrimination that would include... Cast. Now, that would take, again, creative case law and so on, or be express about it. But, of course, we've now got a government that wants to pull back, that wants to get rid of the Human Rights Act, that wants to disapply Section 3 of the Human Rights Act, which is the magic of the Human Rights Act that allows you to interpret other statutes in a compatible way. But I totally agree with you. We, we need to deal with caste discrimination. You know, I'm going to say something mildly controversial. As the daughter of migrants to this country, I am so very disappointed in my fellow children of migrants to this country, in their attitude, not just to stopping the boat. Um, so what, are you a better kind of migrant if you come on an aeroplane or on a ship? Not a little bit. And also the, the attitude to, to things like... Um, discrimination. So very disappointed. And these children of migrants who sit at the top tables of power in this country with elite international education that includes Stanford University, the Sorbonne, Oxford, Cambridge, and they want to rip up international human rights. I am just so very sad and disappointed. And my late parents are spinning. I'm sure their parents are very proud of them. Um, and on, finally, on the human rights and the environment, I mean, I think, and, and the US, and all will be, all will be over if Mr. Trump is, is um, re-elected. Um, I thought you were going to say in prison. Well, if he's in prison, then all is not over. <laughs> but I'm, I'm, look, I, I, um, I understand the source of, of anxiety and, and even despair at times, but I still, I still, I still have hope. And in relation to the... Um, I don't know whether you were intimating, Charles, that um, you think that there's a, there's a tension between human rights and environmental rights. Well, there are, there are tensions, there are always tensions in this framework. 
I don't think there is a fundamental tension between human rights and the environment any more than there's a fundamental tension between privacy and security or free speech and, and, and privacy. You know, um, I think that human rights have a lot to contribute to analyzing these problems. They're not the whole story, but they are of value in analyzing and navigating some, some of these problems. And I, um, I think maybe uh, the, the final chapter of my book will be of interest to you, because I do say to, because there are issues there about protest as well, you know, there are, there are some people who are very upset about ULEZ, for example, or who will be upset about particular policies that are adopted in relation to climate change because of how it affects where they live or their livelihood or whatever. Um, and I, I do try and ad address um, Chapter 7 to people who are even sceptical about climate change. Because whether they're sceptical or not, they have to look at the scale of the consensus and they have to look at the potential ways in which everybody's rights and freedoms are potentially going to be affected by responses to environmental questions. So I think there's something there to be, to be looked at for everybody, whether they're a rights skeptic or a climate skeptic or, or, or whatever. And on the, on the US question, it, it is, you know, I never thought that I would see insurrection in the capital, right? That great, great democracy, you know, the Declaration of Independence is a beautiful piece of human rights lyricism, and I never thought I'd see a fascist president of the United States in my lifetime. And there, I'm using the F word, but I think I, I, think I can pretty much justify it in relation to, um, in relation to, to Donald Trump. It's not, it's not politic or diplomatic to say that now, because he may be president again. Well, he'll, um, if he is president again, it will be incumbent on people to try to uh, restrain him, to temper him, to engage with him, because that is what you have to do in statecraft. But it doesn't mean that I don't call out what, what happened in the past. That insurrection in the capital was, you know, you know incited by him, I think, was pretty, pretty extra extraordinary. And I don't, I don't see value in pretending pretending otherwise, but I still have hope. I do, I do still think the United States is a great old democracy and that has contributed a great deal to human rights discourse. There are great um, people still in that country who, are, who believe very much in rights and freedoms. And one of the revelations to me of writing this book, as opposed to previous, my previous human rights education, is seeing the explosion in human rights thinking and writing in the American Academy in recent years. I, I would say, arguably, to some extent, even ahead of where we are in the UK or in other parts of Europe. And I don't know whether part of that is a response mm -hmm. to Trump, but some of the most articulate, inspirational, clear thinking, plain English writing about human rights is coming out of the United States mm -hmm. and some wonderful cinema as well. I, th I think the staunchest defenders of human rights are, the, are in the places where we have, you know, fully fledged authoritarianism, fascism on the ground. And one of the beautiful things about your book is how it shows how the struggle for human rights is a struggle that has come bottom up and we would need it, you know, more so than ever um, under the regimes to come. Thank you so much to all of you, to all the audience for being here to to today um, to help launch this brilliant defense of human rights, which is more necessary than ever. Thank you so much, Connor Gerty, for, yes, and <laughs> Professor. Thank, Thank you. you so much, B. Rowland, oh, for this, goodness. yeah, fantastic introduction to the work in and thank you. Shami, Shami Chakrabarti. Thank you. I'm going to be a song interpreter at the LSE International Inequality Institute, LSE Human Rights Institute that have hosted us today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. One more clap. <laughs>